All right. Um, Erica, Jim, thanks for being with us today. Um, this is a topic that's been in the news lately when automation goes wrong uh, in your business in particular. And so I wanted to start out and talk about the, um, the Boeing 737 MAX 8 crashes that we've seen recently. Uh, to what extent can we blame uh, automation for those crashes? And I know there's some sensitivity and you know, there's some business interest in here, so you have to dance around this a little bit. But give us your diagnosis to the extent that you can. OK, start right off with the most important question yeah. with the MAX. <laughs> <laughs> um, so when it comes to the MAX, that airplane it was basically um, just a miscommunication between um, the pilots and the airplane. Mm -hmm. um, the airplane was flyable. Um, uh, it was an anomaly that the pilots hadn't expected. There is a quick, easy way to disconnect it. Um, the, the variable on this one is that when it did activate erroneously, there was an additional level of, of, of reaction from the airplane. Um, it, a stick shaker went off, so the normal uh, emergency procedure for the trim runway does not usually involve um, that extra level of, of um, uh, indication from this faulty sensor. So, um, you know, we can balance the issue equally. Um, the between the, the fact that the pilots didn't know about this system, mm -hmm. and the fact that there really was a quick, simple way to, to fix this problem. Um, so, it, the irony of MCAS, it was put in there for a safety feature, right? And it was supposed to be such a simple system that they didn't feel like they even needed to educate the pilots about it because it was supposed to be that simple. It was only supposed to, uh, to act uh, momentarily, a transition moment where maybe the pilot wasn't paying attention. That was the whole purpose of it. The fix is easy, but the hardest part is now educating the public and, um, you know, if you see your airline ticket, that you've got a 737 MAX, <laughs> are you going to feel comfortable getting on it? So. Boeing's got a big challenge ahead of them trying to explain what happened and that it really was a simple fix. So it yeah. um, comes down to training. It, it, you know, it, essentially, it really does. Um, just that simple, basic, raw pilot skills um, and just the, the having that open communication, um, making sure that no matter what automation is put in there, that the pilot is aware of it and to know how to disconnect it if it acts up. So. In terms of automation, mm -hmm. you know, any modern airliner is going to have a, a, a large degree of, moder of, of, of uh, automation. We at the Airline Pilots Association, we recognize that those investigations on the Lion Air and the Ethiopian Air 737 are not complete. It's a little irresponsible of us in the aviation industry to speculate on what the final outcome is. It's not irresponsible to take a look at what has come out already and try to come up with a fix. And I know Boeing has already done that. At the Airline Pilots Association, we're the we're the largest non-governmental safety organization in the world. Mm -hmm. And we have uh, subject matter experts that have looked already at that software. When the 737 MAX comes back into service, which it, it will, we're gonna, be, uh, we're gonna be that final gatekeeper of safety. The pilot at the end of the day, and Boeing has already admitted this, they're going to have to have pilots stand in front of the public and say this thing is safe. Mm -hmm. And uh, what automation can't give us is that vested interest that the pilot has up front. We sit up front, often our mistakes we pay for with our lives, mm -hmm. and we understand that. If you automate aviation where you take that vested interest out, it's probably not going to be safer. So automation, at the end of the day, has to add to the safety of the business model for us to be happy. We're going to take a look at the processes, the procedures, and the software to make sure that the airplane is safe when it comes back into service. Erica, you said something that caught my attention. You said that the, the system itself was very simple. And this is one thing that we think about a lot in our coverage of AI at the Atlantic, which is to what extent do these systems, when they start layering over each other, create these complex scenarios, even if they're one-off scenarios that you know no possible programmer could ever anticipate? Are we, are we at risk, uh, certainly in aviation or, or even in other industries, at, at the software being too complicated? Well, in aviation, there's an infinite number of variables that, of things that can happen. So any engineer that says this is a fail-safe system, I have to laugh in their face because I can <laughs> give them a thousand examples of where it does fail. So th there has to be some fallback, some basic letting the pilot take absolute control of that airplane. There has to be that moment because that computer, when I teach automation to my students, I always explain to them, consider 
automation as your passive aggressive spouse with a very strong opinion, <laughs> right? So they, they only have a limited narrow focus of what they understand in their environment. So when you have an anomaly, it will stick to this idea of what it thinks it's understanding. You can take you know, MCAS, for example, it has this firm belief that the AOA was putting the aircraft in an unsafe position. Mm -hmm. So it can continuously try to correct the problem. Um, and the pilot, it's sitting there understanding what's going on in no way there is a way, but he didn't at that particular time understand how to then have a direct contact with the aircraft. So um, when I teach aircraft systems, we learn most by when things fail. Mm -hmm. So when I introduce a system to my students, we'll you know, talk about generally how it's supposed to work, but then we talk about all the things that will happen to that system if another system fails. So it's those layers is where the trouble comes in. And not understanding the relationship of when this system fails, what will happen to the other systems. So that right now in the industry is the, the complicated part. Um, so we're all kind of having to step back and go back to teaching pilots good decision-making skills. Mm. Raw pilot skills, it's hard to do because we use automation all the time. It, it makes aviation incredibly safe. It allows pilots to work a little longer than normal. If you're on duty for 14 hours, you have to have some sort of automation to make that time go easier. So mm -hmm. um, it's always a teeter-totter. Um, we've kind of overshot what we were able to do. Um, the industry right now is having to take a step back and say, okay, we need to get back to those raw basic skills so that we can go back and handle automation. That's the irony of the whole situation. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, there's an old adage in, in aviation that says uh, that uh, flying is hours and hours of boredom interrupted by moments of sheer terror. And <laughs> <laughs> it's the pilot's job, a well-trained pilot, well-rested, well-qualified pilot. That's the, the, uh, the most important component in a cockpit. And it's that moment of sheer terror where we need to be that calm voice of reason over top of what's going on. And we need to take over and we need to land the aircraft, bring the aircraft back to safety. When you begin your, your pilot training uh, right at the very beginning, you start with an aircraft that's typically not automated in any way. And the first real event that happens to you other than your first flight is your first solo. So now you're in a non-automated aircraft and you're by yourself and you're figuring that out. It's important that when you continue on in your career that you remember back to those days that, hey, I was that last line of defense to make sure that this aircraft is gonna fly safely. And in recent years, when we look back 10 years or so in the United States, we have flown over 100 million flights mm. and we haven't had a, 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 a accident that has been the result of pilot training or uh, uh, automation. And we've been extremely safe. That model is working. But what we need to do is we need, me, need to make sure that the experience is there, the experience and the recency pilots need to fly. So automation is going to be integrated even more so, but you can't let those skills of flying atrophy. If you do, then when the automation fails, which it will, at least in my lifetime, I anticipate that it's going to fail. I need to make sure that I'm ready, I'm current, I'm recent, and I'm gonna be able to bring the aircraft back safely. We have transitioned in our training to emphasize that. Uh, there was a push early on to, turn the autopilot on and leave it on until it lands. And we can hook a, a 777 up, which is what I fly at right out of uh, Newark. We can turn that autopilot on at 200 feet and it'll, I'll, I'll turn it off on the runway in Shanghai 14 and a half hours later. Hmm. That can happen. We don't want that to happen. We wanna be able to fly during that time. We also use simulators to make sure that we, we hone those skills. So we wanna make sure that, that uh, automation comes along, but pilots have to be trained as well. And there needs to be a minimum standard. Um, I don't want to give the impression that, you know, pilots aren't, aren't really doing anything in the sky, but get like, to take your example, uh, of the, the flight to Shanghai, Newark to Shanghai, let's say, um, that's a 14 hour flight. I've been on that flight. Uh, it's a brutal one, maybe not up in the cockpit. Uh, but give me a sense of the, the division of labor on an average flight, a 14 hour flight. What, what are you doing and what's a computer doing? There are phases of flight. There's a takeoff phase, cruise phase, uh, approach and landing phase. So depending upon that phase of flight, there's a lot of interaction. There's also a pre-flight. Mm -hmm. All automation is built by a human being. And then you have to put input data into that automation to make sure it's going to work properly. So our pre-flight phase, there's a tremendous amount of interaction with the crew, coordination to make sure all of the information is, is put in there. 
During the takeoff phase, uh, most pilots, we like to fly, we like to take off and land. I personally, if the weather allows, I'm gonna take off and I'm gonna land that aircraft every single time because that's what I like to do. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I, I, I found a job very early on in yeah. my life where uh, I, I don't, and I don't want to tell my employer this, but, but I, I like it so much that, uh, that the money is, is uh, almost yeah. secondary. And most pilots will say that, yeah. just not during contract And are, are you better at, <laughs> <laughs> are, you, uh, are you better at takeoff than the computer? I believe I am. Yeah. I believe I'm better than not only the computer, but every other guy I fly with. <laughs> <laughs> and every pilot is probably going to have that same what do you think, answer. Eric? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's interesting. So what's the thing that the software can't do that you absolutely need a human for? Well, we have right now is a perfect example, sure. right? Well, who can anticipate that you'll have a dual engine failure after hitting some geese, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's all those things that, that happen um, in, the, in the environment that we can't predict. Um, and so it, it's those infinite variables that only the human can detect. We, we, you know, we program our software, our detectors, our sensors for certain elements, but there's things that will happen all the time. If a pitot tube um, gets iced up at altitude, um, giving a false indication inside, um, you know, it, it doesn't anticipate those things. So uh, for whatever system that it is you're, you're thinking about, I can give you a, a million different scenarios of things that could go wrong. Um, I got hit by lightning in a Boeing 727. Who, who has a checklist for that, right? Hmm. It, you have to be able to fall back under those raw pilot skills, but you also have to have that direct communication with that aircraft at that point, right? At that moment, we had nothing except three good engines, and it comes down to just that fact. I've got three good engines. Um, nothing should happen to this airplane um, now that I can't control. So it's... It's the, the elements of aviation that you can't predict, that you cannot um, program a software system to, to predict, so, mm -hmm. yeah. How did pilot, when automation, and autopilot's been around quite a long time now, but as automation got, you know, it was more widely used and became more sophisticated, what was pilot's initial reaction to it? Were there people that resented it, that didn't want to fly with it, that worried it would put them out of a job? I don't, I don't think Eric and I, Eric and I are old enough to remember when that came out. <laughs> certainly she's not, but, uh, but I think that there was a, a little bit of fear. Uh, I know that uh, when I started flying for United Airlines, it was in the 727, and we had a lot of older pilots that, that didn't want to transition to the new automated systems, and they said, this is where I'm going to end my career. Hmm. And it was unfortunate because it's exciting, and it's, and it's great. The automation provides uh, the ability for the pilot to do divide his attention, look outside, I keep saying his, I'm sorry, no. his or her attention, uh, to look outside the aircraft and, uh, and make sure that we're, we're, we're doing this right. Now you asked uh, a moment ago, what can't the automation do? The, the automation can't program itself. Mm -hmm. A human being has to do that. They can't start itself. Uh, and then it, it uh, in more of a cerebral sense, it can't critique itself. It can't monitor itself. We're always gonna stand there and say, okay, what went right, what went wrong? The computer right now can't, can't tell us that. And uh, it can't investigate afterwards what went right and what went wrong. It can only give us data. And as human beings, you have to interpret that data. Mm -hmm. And I love all the gadgets. Mm. And so yeah. I'm teaching millennials how to fly and the younger generation, what are they called now? Generation Z. Um, so they're coming into my classroom just embracing this technology. They can't even imagine what it's like to fly an airplane without some of it because even their training aircraft now, you get in there, the glass cockpits and these training airplanes. And it's a little terrifying for me to think about it because they've become so reliant right off the bat. Um, mm. The process right now, um, especially with the pilot shortage, we are moving pilots through a little bit faster than we have um, over the last 15, 20 years. So um, they will be able to accelerate that much faster in their education because they already embrace technology. But then my concern is always when that technology goes wrong, it will. Um, you know, do they have those raw basic thought patterns that will that keep them in the sky? And Erica teaches young people how to fly. I have two sons that are in, in college learning how to fly. Mm -hmm. And I query them <clears throat> on their training, and I want to make sure that their training is, is up to snuff because I've, I've seen how they clean their room. And, 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 <laughs> and I want to make sure that they're paying the correct <clears throat> attention to detail right. that they should. <laughs> Because A, I'm paying a lot of money for their education, but B, I want them to be safe. Sure. So I'll ask them, and one of the questions that you probably see with your millennial students mm -hmm. is uh, when you come into the airport uh, area, you're flying at night, how do you find the field? And I, I was taught it's usually a dark spot uh, in the city, and then you're going to use some 
navigation devices to point out where it is, but what, where, what are you looking for, a rotating beacon or something like that? My oldest son, he says, no, Dad, it's right on the screen there. And I said, oh, no, no, yeah. no. Yeah. <laughs> That's not what I want you to learn. I want you to learn the very basics and then build up upon that. So it is a challenge mm -hmm. in education to make sure that we have that. In the United States, uh, we, we've mandated that pilots before they get into an airliner have at least 1,500 hours of experience. At the Airline Pilots Association, we're, we are fully engaged in making sure that, that we uh, have the highest amount of, of training hmm. and we build on that training all the way up. We have uh, uh, programs with the universities. Uh, United Airlines, I know, has a program with the, the university where Erica teaches. Hmm. And uh, we're going to take that cradle to grave, if you will, uh, training um, and, and make sure that this environment stays as safe as it has been. Hmm. Um, Jim, you mentioned earlier some uh, quite impressive stats around airline safety in the United States. Uh, are there dramatic differences in the upkeep of pilot training globally? I can speak for what we do in the United States. Uh, we, we have that minimum training standard. We have that hour standard. And uh, we have talked about a, a, a shortage of pilots. I think mm -hmm. what we have is a shortage of pilots that don't want to fly for, for low wages uh, right now. Mm -hmm. But it is an expensive and it's a, uh, it's a very involved process going from uh, no flying experience to flying an airliner. So uh, over the years, we've, we haven't really paid attention to maintaining that, that cadre of people to take over for us. So there is a shortage worldwide. There's also the, a desire to put pilots in the cockpit so that we can fill the position. And that's, that's a, a little bit uh, concerning and so far in the United States, we've fended off uh, globally. I think that there, there probably is a, a concerning trend that you're going to have less experienced pilots in those cockpits. Hmm. And <clears throat> in the Air Force, uh, are you seeing a trajectory towards unmanned airplanes in general? I mean, uh, a trajectory. I, crew, I saw a trajectory I in my own career. Um, yeah. For those that, that, that don't know, I, I started flying an F-16 and there was a single man fighter. It was, uh, it was uh, very exciting. And, and uh, when I got into my 40s, the squadron I was in transitioned to an MQ-9 drone and I was essentially put out to pasture, or at least that's what I thought. <laughs> But the, the technology in the unmanned world is, uh, is very exciting, and I've been flying that aircraft for nine years. Hmm. Uh, it's different. Hmm. It's, a, it's a different mindset. It's like any automation. It's to augment what we do. Now, in the profession of arms in the Air Force, we're going to surveil and drop bombs and, and uh, make sure that uh, we fight a war. That's different than what we're doing in the airline uh, on a daily basis. It's needed to save lives. It's not necessarily needed to save lives to not have a human in the cockpit. So uh, the trend for particular uh, high risk flight in the Air Force, yeah, there's probably a trend towards uh, unmanned, but uh, in the rest of the world, we haven't moved the needle too far mm. towards that unmanned because at the end of the day, uh, two qualified, well-rested, well-trained pilots are that last line of defense and it's working. The model is working. So uh, to go to the unmanned, it's going to take some time. And I don't think that necessarily in my lifetime we'll see it, but uh, in the future, I suppose. Um, I want to go to the uh, audience in a second for some questions. But before that, uh, Erica, could you see uh, a day when commercial aviation was just entirely unmanned? Um, well, just a quick uh, show of hands. Who would get an, uh, on an unmanned uh, commercial aircraft right now? <laughs> oh, I got one over here. Yeah. Yay. All right. <laughs> um, the reality is it'll happen. Um, I, I, like he was saying, it's not in our lifetime. Um, we were talking about the variables again. Um, I, we're just not there yet. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's it's going to be maybe our children's children. Um, okay, first question from the audience is from Larry, and he asks, uh, he says, you say that a pilot needs the ability to take over, but pilots occasionally have intentionally crashed planes. Should there be systems in place to prevent that? And I want to broaden that out by asking if um, there are systems to prevent sort of any kind of what I might consider like a, a psychological error uh, that, you know, the human software obviously isn't perfect either. Right. Um, are there... Safety and security is our, our primary focus, particularly with, with the Airline Pilots Association. We look at that on a daily basis. The government looks at that through the TSA. 
the uh, the intentional crash. That's a, an extremely extremely rare case mm -hmm. where that may happen, and uh, we haven't seen uh, other than the, the terrorist attacks where it, where it's been two pilots that say, hey, let's end it all today. So our position is that having two pilots on the on the uh, flight deck is probably uh, there's a failure of automation right there. <laughs> <laughs> Tell them I'll call her back. <laughs> the uh, the uh, having that other pilot there to mm. to observe the automation can observe the emotions and and uh, the unimaginable thoughts that go through someone's head that, sure. that may perpetrate that. Right. But having that other person there, um, what we do in 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 society is that we talk people down. Mm. So I think that that always having someone there is uh, is the best bet. And is there a specific training around that? We uh, we we train human factors. Um, mm. uh, we I know that that constantly pilots talk back and forth to make sure that that the frame of mind being able being fit to fly mm -hmm. uh, not only mentally but physically is something that we we have each other's back um, it's not uncommon that to, that through an airline pilot's career you may have somebody who's not feeling well uh, mm -hmm. either physically or mentally and you can query them you can say hey are things not going right today let's uh, let's take a step back and uh, maybe today is not the day to fly Mm -hmm. At the Airline Pilots Association, mm -hmm. we have a, a program, and uh, our pilots uh, work together with uh, mental health professionals, and everybody's life is going to have something go wrong in it. The last thing you want to do is take all of that baggage that you may be dealing with uh, your, your spouse or your kids or parents or, or, or your finances and bring that into the cockpit. So we, on a daily basis, we engage and we say, are you fit to fly? If you're not, we're not going to just get rid of you. We're going to insulate and we're going to take care of you and we're going to make sure that, that, that all of those problems are taken care of so that we don't have the distractions in the cockpit. Hmm. And one thing quickly to mention, because I'm sure it's referencing the German Wings incident, um, that pilot had 660 mm -hmm. some hours, which um, would not happen in a U.S. carrier air um, cockpit. And maybe if they had had the 1,500 hours, a flight crew would have been able to pick up on those mental distress issues. So mm -hmm. just something to throw into the conversation there. Hmm. All right, our next question is from Brian. He says, my son is currently in ATP school and will ultimately become a commercial pilot. What should or will he need to know about AI in the future? <laughs> have a good relationship with it. <laughs> Truly, I, 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 he already knows, um, you know, hopefully he's going through the ranks, starting with the raw basic skills and moving forward. But it's such an incredible industry um, and technology is making it so much safer. I mean, there's 3,300 people will die in car accidents today. You consider in 2017, we had zero fatalities in commercial aviation. It's incredibly safe um, and it's, it has to do with automation. I would say that uh, if if you're entering in, uh, consider the the emergency training that you do, and uh, and certainly Erica can remember <clears throat> in the simulator the first thing you do when automation fails, and typically we're going to go into an emergency when automation does fail. The first line that most people utter is maintain aircraft control, fly the airplane. So if your son is out there learning how to fly the airplane, never lose those skills. Always fly the airplane. Whether or not you're actually flying the aircraft with your hands on or you're monitoring the automation fly the airplane, you should know where you are and where you're going at all times. Mm -hmm. That seems elementary, but when you're distracted by engine failures or, or, or certainly the failures that they had mm -hmm. with the MAX, it's tough to remember where you are in that, in that chain. So maintain that currency, that recency. Stay with it. Mm -hmm. um, our last question is from Peter, who asks, uh, would either of you fly the Boeing 737 MAX 8? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I, I would have no problem uh, getting in the cockpit and, and flying the airplane with a, with a proper amount of training. Uh, I've flown um, four Boeing products, uh, not the 737, but uh, I know that when that aircraft comes back, it's going to have the software. We're going to have the training. Uh, certainly at the Airline Pilots Association, we represent 61,000 pilots with 33 airlines, and several of the airlines have that airplane. It will come back and it will be safer than it ever was. And we're, we're going to make sure that we're part of that piece of the puzzle to make sure that, uh, that the aircraft's safe. And yeah, I would get on it. I would put my family on it. And, uh, and uh, I think it's going to be safe. Erica, Jim, thanks for being with us this morning. Thanks for having us. Yeah.